So uh, let me kick off by setting the stage a little bit. Um, when, when all of you think of global health challenges, I wonder what pops to mind. And I bet what you're thinking are things like HIV AIDS, or child and health mortality, or global pandemics like Ebola and Zika. But what about something as foundational as the ability to see? As I look around the room today, I see lots of people wearing glasses, and I'm sure many more wearing contacts, as I am. And I think that that's something we take for granted, this ability to have glasses or contacts that allow us to see. But imagine that if you couldn't have that for a day, what would you do? How would you drive? How would you work? How would you come here to Fuqua and sit in your classroom and, and learn? Now think about the millions of, the hundreds of millions of people around the world without access to the glasses that they need to allow them to participate in income generating activities, to have access to educational opportunities, to be able to drive safely on the roads around them. And so we are very lucky to have two incredible organizations represented here on stage that are helping solve this problem and doing it quite stylishly, I will say. <laughs> so we have immediately to my left, Ella Goodwin, who is the president of Vision Spring, an innovative nonprofit social enterprise whose mission is to provide access to affordable eyewear everywhere. And then next to her, we have Neil Blumenthal, the co-founder and co-CEO of Warby Parker, a transformative lifestyle brand that offers designer eyewear at a revolutionary price while leading the way for socially conscious businesses. And I'll note that in 2015, Fast Company named Warby Parker the most innovative company in the world. So we have two incredibly innovative organizations here that are working hard to solve uh, great social challenges that we're facing in the world. Ella and Neil's bios are on your conference app. I hope you've all downloaded the app for today. So I encourage you to read more about their backgrounds there. I don't wanna spend a lot of time giving their backgrounds. I'd rather talk to them since they're here. So let's jump into that. What we're gonna do is we're gonna spend some time having a conversation here on stage and then we'll open it up to all of you for questions. So as we're talking, think about and jot down your ideas for questions that you'd love to follow up with. Um, but let's jump in. So Ella and Neil, I'd, I'd love to just start kind of setting the stage. So can each of you describe what your organization does and maybe a little bit about your, your personal story of how you came to that organization and the work? So Ella, can I start with you? Yeah, great. Hi, everybody. Um, so Vision Spring, you got the mission statement. The expanded version of that is we are creating access to youth, your transformational, we're radically affordable. Um, <laughs> are we gonna have a duel about best uh, adjectives? Uh, so radically affordable glasses for earners and learners who earn less than $4 a day in emerging and frontier markets. Uh, just to put that in perspective, uh, we focus our impact. Why do we do this? Um, we want to make sure that people can see well so that they can do well. We want to make sure that they can see the blackboard so that they can succeed in school. Um, at the top of our theory of change, who cares about a theory of change? Yay, you're my people. Okay, so. Um, I'm gonna take complete credit for that. So nice. Case is advocating for theories of change in this building all the time. So it's important, because if you're a purpose first business, you gotta have your purpose at the top. So our purpose is really to make sure that people can improve their functioning, their productivity, and their income. And glasses can do that. Um, we can tell you that glasses increase productivity by over 30%. Uh, and if you monetize that, it turns into about a 20% increase in income at the household level. If you're earning less than $4 a day, that's about 108 extra bucks. So you are willing to part with your limited discretionary income as a customer, you're willing to part with one to two days wages to make that investment in your ability to keep earning a living, to keep caring for your family. And for children, it's totally transformational. Uh, in the short term, eyeglasses will be able to enable a child to acquire one third to one full year of incremental learning 
in the first three months of wearing eyeglasses when you control for the parents' income levels. So imagine that up to a year of incremental learning and the scale and then the new trajectory that glasses can put that child on for their lifetime. So it's a 700-year-old technology. It's not particularly innovative from the technology perspective. Uh, so it's all about how do we get glasses to diffuse to the base of the pyramid. Does anyone want to guess how many people don't have glasses? 2.5, wait for it, billion. It's a very, very, very big market. <laughs> I love that. And tell us a little bit more before we move on to Neil about you. Ella was on a panel earlier today where she said one of the questions that they ask in Vision Spring interviews is, what is it, why Vision Spring and why now? Oh, yeah. Um, I would like to hear your answer, Ella. Oh. So, so what brought you to, to Vision Spring? Why Vision Spring and why now? Um, so I don't have a founder story because I'm a second generation organizational president that came in after a founder because Neil was part of the founding journey of Vision Spring. Um, so I would say that my journey like any sort of big, so if big successes are made up of lots of wins and cumulative experience, um, I have lots of cumulative experience. It started off with, I think, my first interaction with deep poverty at around the age of seven, and I committed my early career to um, social justice and issues of international development. And then I really had the opportunity in Vision Spring to jump to the front line of where I thought international development was going, which was social enterprise and blended revenue models, drawing the best of business practice, combining it with nonprofit, and really having uh, a bottom line, which was impact first, so our social metrics um, are why we exist, but we have a, a blended revenue model. We have philanthropic revenue and we have earned revenue. And I think ever more organizations are gonna be going in that direction in order to really drive their ability to serve more people. Great. So that was fun for me. All right, Neil, we're on to you. So talk a little bit about Orby Parker and how you came to the organization. Sure. Um, well, if uh, Vision Spring is serving people living on less than $4 a day, um, we're trying to save uh, MBA students money when they go and buy <laughs> I feel like um, we need a round of applause for that. <laughs> yes. um, but in, in all seriousness, right, Warby Parker uh, was born in, in business school. Uh, my co-founders, Jeff, Andy, Dave, and I uh, were um, at studying at Wharton. Um, we each had had that experience, walking into an optical shop, getting excited about a pair of glasses, and walking out feeling like somebody had punched us in the face. Um, <laughs> thought that uh, instead of charging $500 or more, we could charge a fraction of that, um, and in the process, build a company that did good in the world. Um, so we set out to create a business plan uh, and then launched it while, while we were at school. Um, this conversation about the business literally started in, in a computer lab in between classes. Uh, Jeff was complaining uh, about uh, his glasses sort of being uh, sort of moderately broken. Um, uh, Dave had just lost a $700 pair of glasses in the seat pocket of an airplane. He was traveling before school. He had worked at Allen and & Company and at Bain & Company before business school, so he could afford $700 glasses. Um, and um, I had worked at Vision Spring, so um, in the process of distributing glasses to people living on less than $4 a day, I actually worked to design glasses that people uh, wanted to indeed wear um, and would visit the factories, primarily um, in, in uh, southeastern China, where uh, the bulk of glasses were being manufactured. Um, and here I'd be producing glasses for people living on less than $4 a day, and then 10 feet away you'd see uh, glasses for Marc Jacobs and Lon Vaughn coming off the, the production line. Um, it didn't quite make sense why there was such a disparity in the end price uh, to, to consumers. Um, you know, prior to um, uh, sort of working at Vision Spring, you know, I, I think like many people in this room, I, I was somebody that wanted to do good in the world. Um, I, I went to Tufts, I studied international relations, I uh, didn't know exactly how that would manifest itself. I, I thought, um, oh, maybe I'd 
get um, excited about uh, conflict resolution under the premise that if people stop killing each other, then we could focus on big issues like health and education. Um, so I did a little bit of coursework on conflict resolution and, and mediation, then worked at a think tank that came up with policies to resolve deadly conflict, realized the policy world uh, wasn't right for me. Um, and it was at that, uh, at that point that I met Jordan Castle, the founder of, uh, of Vision Spring, and over lunch, um, he sort of gave me an opportunity saying, hey, we're launching this pilot program for this idea to train low-income women to start their own businesses, giving eye exams and selling glasses in their communities. Uh, I was like, wow, this is a really powerful idea uh, because there's this massive problem, as Ella mentioned, right? several billion people around the world that don't have access to glasses. Um, and in, to your earlier point, in the hierarchy of needs, right, clean water, HIV AIDS, is always going to get the, um, the, the lion's share of development funding. So um, what is the market-based sustainable solution here? Um, and it just made a, a, a ton of sense. So literally at lunch, I was like, great, uh, I'll move down to El Salvador. And <laughs> moved to El Salvador and have a lot of funny stories from living in an eye clinic for a little bit um, uh, to you know, just finding yourself in, in bizarre situations when you're doing international development work. But it was really there that I, um, uh, I learned a ton about uh, entrepreneurship and marketing and, and lessons that uh, I apply every day at, at Warby Parker. An amazing, amazing story of, of how we talk with our students a lot about tri-sector leadership and needing to understand private sector, nonprofit, government, et cetera. And so you've, you've really kind of lived that journey yourself before coming to Warby Parker. I want to ask you for one little anecdote before we dig into some more questions. Uh, you mentioned starting it while you were a student at Wharton. I remember reading about you know, the four of you launched it uh, one day and then went into class and not knowing whether it would work or not. Can you tell us a little bit more about that moment of, of launching the company at Wharton? Uh, sure. So um, we had, you know, after that conversation in the computer lab, um, uh, we had to like run out to, to class. Um, so we were at class and, um, you know, when you have an idea and you just you can't stop thinking about it, um, this was one of those ideas. So later that night, um, in the middle of the night, uh, I, I was having trouble sleeping. I emailed Jeff, Andy, and Dave, um, and a minute later, Dave responded, and then Jeff responded, and Andy responded, and, and everybody had um, sort of this, this same sort of uh, light bulb type, type moment. So the next day, we went to the, uh, our local bar that was near all of our apartments and uh, sort of said, hey, like, should we sort of explore this a bit? And we committed to um, sort of busting our butts and saying, hey, we're going to at least do everything possible to explore this opportunity. Um, and second, no matter where it leads, let's just make sure that we remain friends throughout the process. Um, so build the business plan, uh, focus on what are the three things that we really needed in order to test this thing, and that was inventory, right? So we designed and produced our first collection. Um, it was um, a, a platform to sell, which was our website. Uh, and then, of course, people need to know we exist, so we did some PR work, um, and we were um, got a commitment from GQ and Vogue that they were going to feature us. Um, GQ was going to put us in uh, their March book. Um, like all things, uh, getting the website up was taking a little bit longer than we had hoped. Uh, we had hoped to launch it in November. November and Thanksgiving passed, December passed, January passed. Um, first week of February, we get a call from the fashion director of GQ, um, and she was like, hey guys, what's the deal? I thought the website was supposed to be live. Um, and we're like, oh, don't worry, we'll have it up by you know, March 1st, so the March issue, like, you don't have to worry. And she's like, guys, the March issue comes out in February. Um, and we're like, oh. Um, fashion lesson number one. Um, uh, so we end up getting the website up. We don't tell any of our friends or family because we didn't know how many bugs were in it, whether it would even work or not. Um, February 15th hits. Uh, the GQ, March issue of GQ hits subscribers' doorsteps. Um, and we just start getting inundated with emails and calls and, and orders. Um, and we went to class the next day. And we were all sitting similar in, in a room like this. but we made sure that we sat in, in the way back. Um, and while the, the professor was lecturing, we were processing orders and responding to customer emails. <laughs> and suddenly, I, 
I felt like a, a, a quiet sit on the, on the room. Um, and I looked up, and the professor was staring at us. Um, and every, all of our classmates were staring at us because um, we were typing furiously. And, Jeff had a habit of typing really loudly. Uh, so, we all know that person. Yeah. <laughs> so I elbowed Dave. He looked up mortified, stopped typing. He elbowed Andy, who then elbowed Jeff. Um, and then we just stopped going to class. <laughs> <laughs> But surprisingly, that is, that is not the lesson I was hoping we would take away from this. But then during graduation, fucking Jeff graduates summa cum laude. And we're like, what, what happened here? Uh, yeah. So how many orders had been, had been uh, submitted by the time you got out of class that day? Do you remember? Oh, I, I wish I knew. I know. It, hopefully, he got the most done. I don't know. <laughs> All right, well, I, you know, one of the reason we've got you both on stage today is to talk about the really innovative partnership that you have between your two organizations. So Ella, I would love to turn to you to help us kind of set the foundation. Um, tell us about the partnership. How does it work? What is it? Yeah, so, um, well, you probably, most of you will know about the partnership in one way, so because it is the, so for every pair that the Warby team sells, Vision Spring is, in a position to make sure that somebody else in a frontier market can get the glasses that they need. So there's a buy a pair, give a pair model at the core of the Warby uh, a value proposition. And we are really, really privileged to be um, the first implementer of that. And I would say that, um, you know, obviously with Neil and Jordan having been colleagues and friends, and um, there's a lot of trust in the relationship between the organizations. Um, but there's also a lot of structure. Um, so we, we have a contract, and we have annual planning meetings, and we have quarterly forecasting and true ups, and we have monthly phone calls and check-ins. And, um, and, and so we're really able to make sure that um, we're living up to the promise that is made to the Warby customers. Um, and, um, and really, the funds that are received by Vision Spring, it is directly, so this is, I think, a really important component of, of partner, strategic partnerships between organizations. So Warby does what they're really good at, and we do what we're good at, and we really, the tail's not wagging the dog, right? So the, in this case, the funder or an investor isn't dictating the Vision Spring strategy. It's really a commitment to the Vision Spring strategy. And so we talk about you know, our two and our three year horizons and where we're going. And then um, Warby is really an investor in that trajectory. And then what's really wonderful for us is that their success is our success. Um, and so that financial support um, really provides, and I think anybody who's been in a fundraising position will know, uh, multi-year commitments are really, really important uh, because it allows you to scaffold out and really uh, build out a, on a plan. And so, um, so I would say there's a, a lot of, there's a, a lot of friendship and a lot of trust. Um, and, and a lot of structure that underpins that. How successful has it been so far? How many pairs have been distributed? Well, I'll say this. We started the, we started the partnership in 2011. Um, it, uh, you guys will have to do the math. Uh, Vision Spring, it took 10 years to sell our first million pairs of glasses. Uh, we should sell a million pairs of glasses this year, uh, in one year. And uh, we have sold 4.2 million cumulative as of December 1st, 2017. That's amazing. So that's through all of that, yes. <laughs> that's through all of the models that, that Vision Spring uses, including the, the partnership with, with Warby Parker. So let me ask you one more question. Um, you know, we talk with a lot of social ventures in the work that we do, and a lot of people mention this partnership and say, I want that. I want the corporate partner that's going to be on the, you know, aligned to the mission and, and helping us scale our work um, in a long-term commitment. Uh, I'm sure there's challenges to it as well. Uh, so what's the advice that you give to other social ventures when they come to you and say, how do I find that partnership? What are the challenges I need to look out for? Yeah, so um, I'll just say, so Vision Spring has 38 corporate partnerships. Um, and the Warby one is our largest and our most significant, and the one that obviously folks will know the most about here. Um, 
But when we're looking at partnership in general, um, it's really all about what's the intersect. So what, what we talked about with the So Wonderful About Vision is vision is an input to so many other people's agendas. So vision is an input to livelihoods. Vision is an input to education and learning outcomes. Vision is an input to road safety. And so really trying to have that conversation about, well, why are we going to do this together? Because if, we're, if, we're, if we can be super aligned on what we're trying to achieve, then we'll find a way to work it out. Um, and I think that that alignment on the purpose and that alignment on the direction, but also the modality matters. Like the fact that Vision Springs a social enterprise is core to why Warby would choose to invest in the Vision Springs strategy. Um, so, so purpose and modality al alignment on that, and then you can kind of work out the kinks um, along the way. And I would say that extends for any kind of partnership because we work with. We have a, a relationship with BRAC, which, which Neil started back in 2006. Um, so that's a relationship, nonprofit to nonprofit. Um, but it's like a marriage. You know, you have good years, you got bad years, you have you know misunderstandings. You come back together, you fall in love, you have amazing years again. <laughs> you know, um, and and um, but you know, it, but it it takes work. Mm -hmm. um, and um, but I think ultimately, sort of values. Uh, agreement on the modality and um, and that core compass point in terms of what you're trying to achieve together. Great. And Neil, let me switch off over to you. So this idea of a, of a buy one, give one model um, has been sort of controversial in the social impact space. There's been examples like Tom Shoes where it hasn't worked as, as effectively as was intended and there was maybe some pushback on, on the companies that were advocating for that. So what makes this different? What makes it a, a better model for this partnership? Um, so uh, maybe I can talk through what our intention was um, when we were putting together a business plan for Warby Parker. We thought it was inherent good to bring down the price of glasses to under $100 here in the U.S. But we knew even with that, there were hundreds of millions of, of people around the world that didn't have access to glasses. So how could we uh, better serve those individuals? And we were debating, hey, should we commit a percent of revenue, a percent of profits? Um, should we commit to, you know, getting a pair of glasses on every, someone's face for every pair that we sell. Um, and we ultimately decided on, on that third option because at the end of the day, actually, the cost, while it, it, it matters from our profitability standpoint, the cost is not the desired outcome. Right? The desired outcome is not a dollar figure. The desired outcome is that there are human beings that can now see clearly and live their full potential. So we wanted the program to be focused on that. The second reason was, hey, you know, if for some reason we're not running this company in the future, um, percent of revenue, percent of profits, those, those can be manipulated in, in different ways. Um, so we wanted it to be intricately tied to the brand. And we thought by this commitment, we would uh, make a, a, a deeper commitment. You know, in terms of um, whether there's controversy around the buy a pair, give a pair um, uh, model or not, you know, Tom's is the most well-known uh, model. I, I think that, you know, one thing that I learned in my years doing international development is that um, there are always unintended consequences and, um, and good intentions um, don't uh, necessarily result in um, desired outcomes. Uh, and when I uh, read research papers on uh, the distri distribution of shoes in, in certain communities, um, I don't uh, see the impact that uh, I would want as an international development professional. Right? There was a research study that showed that um, school attendance didn't increase um, and that, if anything, there was a marginal increase in the perception that shoes should be paid for by outsiders. Um, so, you know, just from our perspective, glasses, the outcome is an impact is a lot clearer. Um, and I don't mean to use that pun, but somebody has a <laughs> pair of glasses, they do better in school. We know that. We, there's a lot of research that backs that up and that's just, frankly, intuitive. Um, 
then uh, we know that people are able to perform better in work if they can see. We know that it reduces traffic accidents, and, and we have a bunch of research to, to show that. Um, and the way that Vision Spring uh, provides those glasses, again, is in a way that treats people with dignity, that treats people as a value-conscious consumer versus um, a needy beneficiary. Um, and, and that's uh, really important to us. Um, and even the way that we talk about it, you know, we, we do often capture imagery to, to sort of showcase the work of, of Vision Spring. Um, and I know it's really important to Vision Spring, and it's really important to us that uh, that imagery is not uh, development porn, um, and that there aren't um, this imagery of white man's burden, um, and that uh, it, it captures um, uh, the dignity of, you know, Nonprofit and the men and women that are helping to enable people to get glasses and the recipients of those glasses. Yeah, and I, if I can pile on there, so the the element like beneficiary is a bad word at Vision Spring, um, and and so is impact actually. Um, and the reason is because impact is one of these butterfly words that float around and, not a, and, and lots of people can assign lots of meaning to them. So we really focus on evidence, um, and for us being able to anchor. Um, our results on, on the evidence and on the literature, um, or where we need to build the evidence ourselves. So um, we've just um, we've just finished a randomized control trial, and it's just gone to peer review. So if we get published, I'll let you know. Um, uh, but but on the idea of the customer, it's so important for us because they're paying, and we're asking them, and we're asking people to pay. Um, and in some cases, it's heavily subsidized. Um, and for school children, it's often, the question is who's the payer? Um, and so in some instances, it will be the truck driver, it will be the mobile phone repair person, it will be the garment worker, and that person is going to pay. So they, it needs, our value proposition anchors on a radically affordable pair of eyeglasses that are durable because it needs to last at least 12 months. And the, we're working in markets where there's tons of gray market product, lots of counterfeit stuff, um, and lots of things that'll snap in three months. Um, and so it needs to last at least 12 months, if not two, sorry, 12 months, if not two years. And the other really important part is it's gotta be attractive. People are got you know, people wanna put it, it's on their faces. And there are so many um, circumstances where people get given something that, um, you know, Jordan's favorite story is, is uh, a pair of cat glasses with rhinestones. And the woman would rather have been blind than be mocked for wearing them. And she came, she actually traveled six hours back to return the glasses rather than, rather than wear them. But the idea that we owe our customers a value proposition, it forces us to um, continue to serve them uh, and to really develop a product line um, that, that they will want to purchase because the reason why there's not enough eyeglasses in the world, part of it's a supply problem. Part of it is um, routes to market. There are not enough points of distribution. It's The glasses are totally locked up in the health sector. Optometrists and ophthalmologists are not friends of getting more glasses on faces. I hate to be the one to say it. Um, there was an optometry association in Nigeria that organized a raid on pharmacies for trying to sell eyeglasses, basic over-the-counter reading glasses. Um, and, but the idea that 70% of the people who need glasses in the world just need, just need reading glasses, um, and that those are an over-the-counter product, but that people are really, everything that we're gonna do is be oriented toward that low-income individual as a, as a consumer. It's amazing to, to hear the passion from both of you around, around this topic and the clear alignment between your organizations uh, and, and the origins of why this partnership started. Um, I'm, I'm interested though, Neil, to push on you a little bit to say clearly there's alignment here. Clearly you are authentic in, in having worked at Vision Spring and been part of this journey from the beginning. What about your investors? Warby Parker has, has brought in a lot of investors over the years. Are they as aligned? Do, they, do you get pushback from them about this, this part of your business model and what do you say? Um, so we've never ever gotten in any pushback. Um, have we gotten as many questions about it as, as I would have liked? Probably not. Um, uh, but you know, our investors, which run the gamut from high net worth individuals and celebrities, from Ari Emanuel, Ashton Kutcher, and Jimmy Buffett to um, 
big venture funds uh, to now uh, mutual funds like T. Rowe Price um, and, and Wellington. Um, and uh, they're investing in a company that is tackling a big market um, that has longevity, uh, that has a great culture so that it will sort of maintain high growth rates um, and hopefully high levels of profitability for years to come in the future. Uh, and they recognize that that culture and that brand um, that employees buy into, that consumers buy into, is, uh, is dependent on, uh, on our mission. Um, and our mission is to you know, provide vision to, to the world, and, and it includes uh, our buy a pair, give a pair program. So um, we've uh, never gotten any pushback with, whatsoever. And, and have these investors been impact investors, quote unquote, or more traditional? No, these are all sort of traditional, um, hardcore finance folks. Um, mm -hmm. They love spreadsheets. <laughs> Don't we all have spreadsheets, right? <laughs> and they wouldn't see their spreadsheets without right. their boxes. <laughs> Way to bring that home. That was good. <laughs> you guys are well practiced. Um, I, I'm trying to watch the time so we make sure we have, have time for questions. I want to talk a little bit about the future. So for both your organizations, Ella, I'll start with you. What's, what's the future hold for Vision Spring? Where are you driving towards? Yeah, so um, like... Like a lot of organizations in our space, you know, the magic word is scale. Everyone's looking for scale, the pressure of scale. Um, where, where, where are you on the J curve? Um, so we think a lot about that. Um, and I would say at the moment, so the question for us is really uh, thinking about, there's this giant, so there's this giant problem, right? 2.5 billion people. And how do we make a meaningful dent against that? What can we do as an organization as an operating organization, as a sales organization, and where do we need strategic alliances and partnerships? So um, I will say that Vision Spring is heading at 10 million pairs, um, and we have iterated such that we have three business models. Um, our wholesale business model, which has really strong sell-through support to hospitals, clinics, um, NGO partners, uh, that, that we do training and we help them with marketing. Um, we have a second business model, which is a third party payer model, and then we do, we do retail. The wholesale model is the one that's really scaling. I would say we're in growth stage on our third part, party payer model. And the retail one, um, we use as a, a lab and we keep it really small. It's designed for us to be able to train our people and to understand our customer and to understand product development. Um, there are some things Vision Spring decided not to do uh, by ourselves. And so, um, Jordan, we were looking at, you know, when you're looking at this, this path to scale and the bridge from growth to scale, you know, what are all the inputs that are required for that? And ones that preoccupy me at the moment are things like technology, but one of the other really important ones are things like policy. Um, and so what's going on in the ecosystem that's got it all locked up? And so as an operating organization, Vision Spring looked at itself and said, you know, are we the ones to do that? And we decided, and with our board of directors, no, uh, we're going to spin off an organization. And Jordan is now the co-founder of something called iLiance. And iLiance uh, now has about 70 different um, NGO, you know, traditional vision actors, but government partners. But then the, you know, the likes of Mahindra Mahindra and Time Warner and other people um, who are party now to this idea that vision is not just a health issue, it is an input to a whole bunch of sustainable development goals, and there are a bunch of things that need to be unlocked at a macro level in order for a bunch of us to make progress against this big problem. So operationally, we're targeting 10 million pairs, but there's this high level um, work that's being done by Jordan and a bunch of us um, at the macro level. It's incredible, it's been an incredible journey for Vision Spring. We've been honored to get to watch it at Case and, and are looking forward to seeing where it goes. Uh, Neil, similar question for you. Future of Warby Parker. I'm going to be pointed about this one, though. You guys have raised a lot of money in your day. Inquiring minds want to know, is there an IPO in the future? What's coming up next? <laughs> um, well, we're not in a quiet period, so uh, I, I can definitely talk about it. Um, we've raised $215 million to date. Um, those people do have to get their money back at some point. Um, we uh, They'd are, like to hope so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hopefully, they'll make a lot of money. Um, you know, our goal is to build a, a, a brand that um, 
is going to be around for, for 100 plus years. Um, and we think that we're best suited to do that as an independent company. Um, we view an IPO really as a financing event. Um, we have a lot of capital on our balance sheet, so there, there's nothing that's imminent. But it seems like it's a, the most likely outcome for us. Uh, we continue to grow really quickly. Um, our e-commerce uh, business is thriving. Uh, we were the first uh, to, to use iPhone X's true depth camera uh, for, for e-commerce. So if you have an iPhone and you want to download uh, the Warby Parker app, um, you can actually scan your face and we take measurements and then recommend frames for you, um, which is pretty cool. We've been waiting for this uh, hardware to, to come out uh, for since we basically started the business. So we're really excited about that. Uh, we also have um, uh, a, another app, Prescription Check, um, in which people can take um, a simple vision test uh, from their home or their office. Uh, and we transmit that data to a network of doctors that review it and we send you a signed prescription. Um, and if you think that, um, you know, eye doctors uh, are ransacking optical shops only in Nigeria, um, <laughs> you'd be wrong. Because um, we face uh, a lot of opposition, um, uh, basically sp narrow special interests, putting their uh, financial interests ahead of the public interest. Uh, and we're fighting battles state by state now to ensure that people can still use telemedicine um, uh, for this emerging technology, for vision tests and, and, and for other forms. Uh, and we find that uh, the optometry lobby, um, so uh, optometrists make over 60% of their income through the sale of glasses, uh, and they use that eye exam to get you in the door, and then you have to exit through the gift shop. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, they, they, they're not big fans of Warby Parker, um, and they're definitely not uh, big fans of our, our prescription check technology. Um, so we're spending a lot of, uh, more time than I'd like to uh, on, on the policy front there. Um, but the other thing I'm excited about um, are some of our bricks and mortar stores. So we now have 64. Um, uh, after this talk, I'm actually going to head to Charlotte uh, to say hello to our team there. We have a store in Charlotte, um, and uh, we'll have 90 by the end of the year. Um, which, which is a lot of fun. That's exciting. Exciting plans for both organizations. Um, what I want to do is a quick sort of lightning round of questions and then open it up to, to all of you for your questions. I think there's been a lot of great fodder for follow-up, so I'm excited to engage in a conversation with the audience. But quick lightning round before we go. So I'm looking for quick answers. Uh, what keeps you up at night? The gap between rich and poor. Mm the privatization of philanthropy, my daughter, and, <laughs> and purchase conversion rates. <laughs> You're busy at night. <laughs> uh, about you? Uh, people. Um, hire, hiring the right people, firing the wrong people, managing all people. <laughs> Just people. people. Um, one thing that you wish you knew when you were in grad school. Neil, let me start with you on this one. Um, so I think we started to learn this towards the end of grad school, but um, that is uh, not everything has to be a major decision. Um, and when you feel like you have to make some giant leap of faith, uh, take a step back and break down that decision in, into smaller pieces. Um, and uh, that has served us really well as we've been uh, growing Warby Parker. Um, I think in the land of academia, it's really easy to make things more complicated. And um, I think probably learning how to be simple um, is really important because we can only be good at a few things at a time. Mm -hmm. Great. And then last one. The focus of, of this conference is on the future of impact. So what is the most important trend that our attendees should keep their eyes on from your perspectives? So I need to become a student of blockchain. Um, <laughs> um, and I, because I think what it can do for low income markets will be revolutionary and, um, and just really need, being able to understand that potential. Um, and then I think the big impact investing for an organization that's in our space is really important because we, 
we have parts of our, our, our entity that are really always going to be subsidized, working with children. Um, the payer there is only ever going to be government or philanthropy because the families at our income level can only contribute a, a small amount. But there are other parts of our organization that have the potential to really come down to break even or, or, or to be profitable over some kind of time with, with big volume because we are a, a low margin, high volume business model. So um, really understanding what's happening in the impact investing space particularly as it gets to understand itself. I think there's been 10 years of impact investing um, evolution, and I think it's only just starting to, to, to organize itself, and it's really just the beginning, and I think you know, eventually you know, the teachers' funds are all gonna have impact investing uh, components. I think it'll, it'll come quite mainstream um, in the years, and that's wonderful for everybody else in this room who wants to start a venture. Neil, what about you? Um, I'd probably go to the 40,000 foot level and a macro trend is, a, I think, just change. So one of our core values at Warby Parker is to embrace change because uh, it used to be that you have these big changes, you know, maybe every couple decades. Uh, we've already had to change our business model considerably in, in less than eight years. Um, uh, so uh, I, I leave you with that thought. And um, as an individual, you need to figure out how to be an amazing lifelong learner because every single role that you're in will evolve dramatically, um, uh, not over a 10-year period, but over a couple-year period. Um, and you need to build uh, malleable and resilient uh, organizations that can um, recognize uh, you know, changing situations and, and adapt quickly. Fantastic. Well, let's open it up to all of you. We have microphones somewhere. I see one over here. Uh, so microphones on each side. What I'm going to ask you to do is if you have a question, raise your hand. We will find you with a microphone. Wait for the microphone because we are recording, so we need to have your voice there. And please, so that we can get as many questions in as possible, if we can keep our questions short and in the form of a question, that would be fantastic. <laughs> we'll start with Blair back there. Great. Hi. Thank you so much. It's been really great hearing your perspective on vision and the vision industry. And now I'm curious to hear your perspective on each other's roles. So we've heard a bit about your perspective on your own companies and your own sort of development and, and work. And curious what you think is the most challenging and exciting part of each other's uh, roles in this space. In terms of how we, how we collaborate together? I'm, I'm curious, you know, like, uh, Ella, what do you think is the most exciting and challenging part of Neil's job and what he's facing oh. and vice versa? <laughs> Neil, what do you think is most exciting and challenging about what Ella is doing? Um, well, you've been closer to my job than I have been to your job, I think. <laughs> um, so I, watching the pace of growth uh, for Warby and the, and the team component and, and the, um, I think the, the stages that you've really systematically worked through um, is really exciting for us as a partner organization. Um, and I would say that we, Vision Spring, benefits a lot, um, not just from financial support, but um, their comms team is great, and we work with them. And um, Lon, who's their head of technology, is on our technology advisory committee. So as they're looking at new technology, we're also looking at new technology. So as they're innovating, we're, handheld refractive devices are really important for us. So we like to watch what they're doing, because there are going to be knock-on effects for what we can apply in, in our markets. Um, I, I think L is probably the most challenging aspect continues to be fundraising in that I'm always shocked when I sp speak to donors or potential donors and their lack of uh, understanding of international development of social enterprise um, still. And um, it, it frustrates me to no end. So um, I can only imagine <laughs> the frustration you sometimes feel having to um, explain something that is so obvious to uh, us and everybody in this room. Where's the other mic? Okay, go ahead. Hi, uh, this is for you, Ella. So with um, vision and visual acuity being such an important input to an individual's overall output, what can you do in order to make sure that that younger population is appropriately screened um, to ensure that they don't miss out on developmental and educational yeah. needs? Because if they do have a visual impairment, even if it's you know, not a severe one, those early stages are so crucial for them to be seeing appropriately. And the more time they miss, the further they fall behind. Yep, yeah. 
Yeah. So the interesting thing about um, vision, and lots of children don't get screened. In fact, I was surprised how many times I had to ask my pediatrician to screen my child. Um, and so if anyone has kids, make sure your pediatrician is screening your child, because they don't, by default, do it. Um, the, the other is just that myopia, there is a sweet spot for the development of myopia, and it tends to be between the ages of, um, six, of 8 and 14 is when we see the most amount of onset. So from an international development bang for your buck point of view, we target those years. We tend to find if we screen really younger, much younger children, we have to screen um, 100 children to find two that need glasses. If we start screening the 8 to 14 year olds, we'll screen 100 kids and we'll find 9 to 10 who need glasses. Um, so we target at that age group. Um, I, I would also add, sometimes um, when you're looking to tackle a problem, uh, sometimes take the non-obvious uh, approach. And, and what I mean by that is that uh, if you wanted to solve drunk driving, right, um, one path is to join Mothers Against Drunk Driving and do a lot of PSAs. The other path would be to start an autonomous vehicle company. Uh, and the question is, what's going to have the biggest impact on drunk driving? It's already had. It's actually a company that we all probably both love and hate, Uber. Um, and uh, I often also think about Tesla, right, that's trying to transform energy. Right? Where did they go? They went to the top uh, of the market, right, marketing sports cars to super rich people um, in order to right, build a company that could then go, go mass. Um, and one of the, I, I learned this lesson firsthand at Vision Spring when I would go into rural villages and nobody would be wearing a pair of glasses. And the international development um, uh, uh, at, at that time was, uh, I would say, a, a naive um, uh, international development um, uh, professional, not, maybe not even quite a professional yet, um, going in was like, okay, well, I want to serve the people that are most in need, um, right, that have the least amount of resources. Um, but that was the hardest and most difficult way to get people to wear glasses, where as if I followed an influencer strategy like one would do with a fashion brand in the US, right? You go to the uh, Kendall Jenners of the world who have plenty of money, plenty of, plenty of free stuff, but you give them an additional free something in hopes that they wear it and they post it on Instagram. You go to this uh, Sarpanch in uh, a village in, in uh, southern India, give them a free pair of glasses, they wear it, uh, right? And that starts to change uh, 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 mindsets and, and make wearing glasses m more acceptable. Um, so uh, I would just sometimes think about um, where you target. And it's certainly easier when distributing glasses, for example, to go to somebody who has some disposable income, somebody who's working, who's an adult, um, who then can justify, I'm going to spend money on this pair of glasses because it's going to help me make more money, for example. Um, There's a question over here. Yep, go ahead. I'm, I'm struck, even though we're in a business school, by how liberal artsy you both sound. <laughs> and um, I mean, you're talking about things at a, a very sort of 30,000 foot level, but I also know that in your day to day lives, there's a lot that pulls your attention down to the ground. And I'm curious about how you train your minds to be able to flip back and forth between the minutia of the work and the big picture that the minutia connects back up to. We talked about that in our last yeah, panel a little great bit. Question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Would you want to go on that one first? Um, I'm a liberal arts guy. Uh, I, went, I went to Tufts undergrad, uh, studied international relations and history. Um, uh, I, I don't know if I've trained my brain uh, to, to do that. I've, I think I've always been certain passionate about certain things and think a lot about the vision, but then been very practical about like what are the 10 steps to make uh, action happen. Yeah, so I, I was vast, faster undergrad um, and um, focused on sociology and geography. Um, I do know a map, though. I don't need, I don't need my Google Maps for everything. <laughs> um, the, um, we mentioned this in, in the last panel, but the, I, I do find it sort of my, my daily challenge is to be able to figure out sort of the best and highest use of my time. And it's so easy to get, t to get really bogged down in the weeds. And sometimes it's really important, because sometimes there's something down in the weeds that need to be unlocked. And you got to feel really close to what's going on. Um, and then other times, it's really important for me to be able to pull up. I do find that there are times in the calendar that really help. Like, so uh, we tend to, I, I 
very purposely tend to use board meetings as my own excuse to do strategic thinking, and it's a mark in the calendar. Um, just, but I should also share that um, our board meets quarterly. We have a call in between, and I give them a weekly update. So I have a pretty hands-on board. Um, and, but I do find that the day-to-day -day telescoping um, matters a lot, um, particularly in terms of how I discipline my own self with time management and trying to figure out, is this the best of high, you know, the highest use of my time? And I remember one moment I did, I, I found myself um, editing a voucher that was going to be used. And I just thought, oh god, I, what I really should be spending my time on is the position description for a marketing director. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. We've got time for one last question up here. Um, there were a couple of comments that you each made that I'm wondering if we can tease out just a little bit more. And in full disclosure, I'm with an organization called GuideStar which is about helping to educate people about the nonprofit sector. So Ella, you mentioned concern about privatization of giving. And um, I think there was also a discussion about how do we educate donors, Neil? Um, things that should be obvious but aren't. What can we do to really help um, it, it inform people more easily? And what's going on in the donor space that is of concern? So I'll, um, so I think first of all, there are a lot of really great things happening in the donor space. So I would say when Vision Springs first started, the idea of social entrepreneurship was a pretty hard and, and, and early sell. Um, and um, the idea that there should be, or there could be revenue generating models that are tied to philanthropy, that, that revenue stretches the philanthropic dollar further, that you can, you know, if, if we only had um, our philanthropic capital, we could only serve 50% um, of the people that we're able to serve because we have a blended model. So I think there's so much more openness now to blended models. In fact, I think a lot of people are really quite hungry to find more and more of them. Um, if I can be candid, I am sometimes surprised how cheap donors can be um, and how um, focused they are on innovation and the early stage activity and the follow on money isn't always there. So um, where, where is the scale money going to, where is the scale money going to come from? Um, and I get asked a lot of questions like, how are you innovative? I was like, well, tell me what that means for you. Um, what kind of risks do you uh, expect? Tell me what your risk tolerance is. You know, um, uh, what kind of impact are you having? I don't know what kind of evidence are you looking for. Um, so I find we get asked these questions all the time by people who haven't defined it for themselves. And so sometimes you feel like you're you're like hitting a target that you don't you don't know you don't know what target you're trying to hit or what you're talking to because actually the person hasn't defined it for themselves. There are some amazing organizations that have gotten really sophisticated about this stuff. I think the, the growth of the venture philanthropy space is really exciting. Um, I wish more people would follow into that. Um, I think there are a lot of people, the, the biggest generational tran transfer of wealth is happening now. There's so many good practices that, that people who are starting off as new philanthropists can really jump to. They don't have to start with the give a fish model, you know, and the equivalent of philanthropy is just like write the check model. Um, so yeah, I would say there's lots of exciting things happening, but um, it, I, I'm always surprised in the in the in the obsession about scale is um, how hidden the scale money can be. Um, to draw some contrast with uh, uh, fundraising in in sort of the uh, for profit uh, in the for profit model. Uh, I find that the language is much more uh, defined and fixed um, and when I've been raising money for Warby Parker than um, in, in the social enterprise and the nonprofit world where I find that the nomenclature um, shifts almost every six months, if not every couple of years. Um, and I have my own theories on, on why that is, because um, there is a sexiness about newness and, and status around um, uh, newness and even the word innovation um, that, you know, I think is in super important, especially when 
might not have the financial compensation that you have um, at, at for-profit uh, companies. So if, um, if we could narrow uh, down the language that's being used to describe things, I, I think that would be helpful. Um, obviously, metrics is a, is a huge, huge thing. Right In the for-profit world, we have uh, a gap, um, and everybody is, tends to be focused on the same key metrics that make comparisons um, easier. Um, the, uh, the metric of um, uh, overhead as a percent uh, of budget, um, I think, is way overused. And, uh, and um, I almost want to eliminate that metric in its entirety. Not that in its own right it, it's bad, um, but it, if it is the single uh, most used metric, it, it's, it's really problematic. Um, whereas if I were to compare that to right, how you value um, for-profit companies, yes, we're looking at profitability, whether that's EBIT or EBITDA or net income, or what have you. Um, and then we have all these other secondary metrics, and maybe it is um, marketing as a percent of revenue. And, and I view overhead as a percent of, of the total budget as a secondary uh, metric. And if it's not going to be used as a secondary metric, then I'd rather it just be never talked about um, uh, again. Um, so I think in an ideal world, um, and I, um, uh, if there aren't going to be metrics that work for every single um, uh, nonprofit across the board, but maybe we can do a better job at grouping uh, uh, nonprofits um, uh, in certain sectors so that way we have centralized metrics for, for at least categories. And as we're wrapping up the conversation, I want to give a moment to, to ask if either one of you have a parting thought that you want to share. We've got an audience full of a lot of MBA and undergrad and graduate students, as well as professionals that are thinking about how they can have an impact in the nonprofit sector, in for-profit companies, et cetera. So having you two here, I just want to give that opportunity. Do you have any parting thoughts that you want to share? <laughs> um, <laughs> They're your people. So I'm um, kidding, sorry. You know, <laughs> I, I, um, I think that Focus has been uh, a real key to success for, for Warby Parker, and I could list a bunch of different examples of it. For example, the fact that we're still really just operating in the US and a little bit in, in Canada, the fact that we've stayed within a certain category and not expanded in, into a bunch of other uh, categories. Um, so uh, I, I would just share you want to have big impact in a short period of time when you've got to concentrate efforts. Um, so I uh, would encourage uh, people at times to go deep um, and as opposed to just going wide. And in the process of going deep, um, you might get some ideas that enable you to go other places. Uh, but if you're just staying really wide, that, I think that's, uh, that's hard to do. It's great from a professional perspective as well as personal advice there. Anything from you all? Um, so I don't have my MBA. Um, but I think surrounding, uh, surrounding oneself, surrounding myself with other people who have complementary skills. So um, as I look to hire, I'm really, really conscious about hiring people that are going to be um, adding something new to the team or a balance for myself or, or really bringing their own superpower. So one of the questions we ask when we interview is, what's your superpower? Um, sort of knowing what you're really good at. And I think so often we think about what are our, um, you know, what are our areas that we need to improve upon and what are the new skills, but really like knowing what your own personal strengths are because and being able to build on those and to be able to offer those forward boldly and proudly um, to whatever organization you're going to um, because we're looking for your superpowers. Um, and then I would say the other one is, um, Really, uh, and I, I've been thinking about this a, a lot the last several months, but um, understanding the kind of organization that you're going into and where they are so in, in its own growth trajectory and knowing that sometimes in a small organization you're going to have a really wonderful breadth of experience, but you might have to deal with a lot more ambiguity and, and role fuzziness, but you might acquire a broad range of experience. 
um, as opposed to being in a large organization, which might allow you to go really deep and, and really become a super expert at something much more micro, but being a little bit aware about which, which range you want to go into. And then if you are going into a high growth organization, I think probably both of us have this experience, like it will stretch you. And so, um, and so I think just being ready for that personal growth journey um, and being able to surround ourselves by people who are going to be able to keep up with the pace of growth of the organization and really not just keep up, but get out ahead of it. Because when, when you're an individual who's getting out ahead of the pace of growth, you actually become a driver of that growth. And I think any, anyone who's really looking at trying to make a big impact or, or really grow a large organization, um, really we want to surround ourselves with people who are going to be those lifelong learners and who are going to be, who are, are ready and hungry to stretch and grow because the organization really will demand it of anybody who is going to rise up um, and be a leader in the company. Fantastic. Well, I know I, it's been a thrill for me to get to talk to you both today. We're so thankful that you are here to share the stories of your two organizations and the partnership in between. Uh, I've learned a ton. I'm sure everybody else here has as well. So please join me in thanking Neil and Alex. <laughs>